Hi, uh, welcome back to Subject to Cross. This is Peter Kratza, and I'm taking the lead in this episode. <laughs> However, I will call myself a co-host along with... I'm your host, <laughs> Caroline Donato. We really need to get over this. Okay, in keeping with uh, a prior episode uh, about current events, um, this event isn't current, although it is on Netflix right now. And it's a show I watched, and I, I suggested that Caroline watch it because it really resonated. In fact, moved me to the point where I almost cried at the end. I definitely had tears in my eyes at the end. I'm not never going to admit that, especially on a podcast. Um, I'm talking about American Nightmare. Um, which is a three-part miniseries on Netflix. It's excellent in the way that it was done, and I would highly suggest it to anybody that's interested in this sort of stuff. Um, to provide a little bit of backdrop, and I guess it's spoiler alert, but you do kind of get an idea early on in this miniseries what I'm going to tell you. Yeah, if you if you don't want spoilers, turn us off, watch it, and then turn us back on. Perfect. Thanks. You're welcome. So I'm reading um, from the San Francisco Chronicle, which is now about the fifth newspaper that I have been convinced to subscribe to electronically to get beyond paywalls. So in this, this is from the San Francisco Chronicle. This is a couple weeks ago, January 20th of 2024. Um, quote, uh, this is that the uh, headline. My name is Denise Huskins. Behind the Chronicle's role in the American Nightmare kidnapping case. And just read some excerpts. It was Tuesday, March 24th, 2015. And as the Chronicle's breaking news editor, I was overseeing a big story. The day before, a Vallejo physical therapist named Aaron Quinn had called the police to report that his live-in girlfriend and co-worker, Denise Huskins, had been kidnapped by one or more intruders who demanded a $17,000 ransom. Search teams were being dispatched. The victim's family was pleading for her return. And my lead crime reporter, Henry Lee, was outside the home in the Mare Island. I don't know if it's Mare or Mare. I'm going to call it Mare. I thought it was Mare. All right, I'll say Mare. Mare Island area that had been breached. The email buzzed Lee's phone at 12.24 p.m. He was stunned when he opened it. The subject line was, Denise, the writer stated that Huskins will be returned safely Wednesday. We will send a link to her location after she has been dropped off. She will be in good health and safe while she waits. Any advance on us or our associates will create a dangerous situation for Denise. Included was an audio clip, a proof of life recording that uh, uh, mentioned current events and the first concert she had went to, to uh, you know, for authentication purposes. Um, and this is the uh, the reporter. I'm looking around, thinking someone's playing a joke. Lee, now an on-air reporter for KTVU, told me recently. So basically. The, there's all kinds of press around the fact that this uh, physical therapist had been abducted, kidnapped, taken out of her home, and now this taken reporter, out of her boyfriend's home. her boyfriend's home, and now um, you know this reporter gets an email about the fact that uh, the kidnapper is is supposedly emailing him. Um, Lee forwarded the email to me. This is his boss who's writing this article. And the Chronicle's then editor-in-chief, Audrey Cooper, we decided to forward it to the Vallejo Police Department. It would not be the last email we would receive. What happened that day and the day after is the subject of American Nightmare, the new Netflix docuseries that features Huskins, Quinn, and Lee, and is so infuriating that I found myself shouting at the television. This is the spoiler. The kidnapper, a psychotic ex-Marine and Harvard Law School graduate named Matthew Muller, drugged Huskins, put her in the trunk of a car, drove her to his parents' vacation home in South Lake Tahoe, then held her for two days and raped her twice before dropping her off near her family's home in Huntington Beach. Back in Vallejo, her boyfriend went to the police and recounted what had happened. Yet police doubted Quinn, the boyfriend, almost immediately, they not only took saliva and blood samples from him and gave him a lie detector test before telling him he failed it, but directly accused him of being involved. It doesn't make any frickin' sense, Detective Matt Mustard told Quinn during an hours-long interrogation featured in American Nightmare. 
on March 25th, 2015, just hours after Huskins was released. That's the victim. After she's released, a Vallejo police spokesperson, Lieutenant Kenny Park, gathered the media and declared the whole affair to be a hoax. And a little bit of backdrop, there was litigation after this. And in the litigation, they uncovered the fact that uh, Park's police chief told him to go out and give that press conference calling it a hoax and said, quote, do you know? Burn that oh. B-I-T-C-H, end quote, in case we're, our editors are Yeah, here. where my mind was going is it didn't, it didn't even reach litigation. I think they settled out they of settled, court. Yeah. So for nearly four months, Huskins was branded a, quote, gone girl, a reference to the Ben Affleck movie, which I've never seen. Oh, you should. Have you ever read the book? No. You should read the book. Okay. Um, however, um, months later, the couple was vindicated. Huskins kidnapper broke into a home in Dublin and attacked another couple, but left his phone behind. Police in that city, led by a determined detective named Misty Karasu, tracked him down, basically linked him to the what had happened in Vallejo, and uh, ultimately uh, Mueller was charged with both that crime and the Huskins kidnapping. What this article says is what is not recounted in detail in the documentary is what happened at the Chronicle where our confusion and frustration at the beginning of the investigation turned into regret that we hadn't exposed the hoax accusation by a notoriously troubled police force as the true fraud. And they say that they, when they gave them the proof of life recording, the police wouldn't even verify that that was her name. Which I, listen, this is the press wanting, I guess, like a quid pro quo, if we're going to give you this, I can understand the police not doing that. But what came to light um, is that the police, for instance, when the, the boyfriend, Quinn, walks into the police station and tells him his girlfriend's been kidnapped and tells him that the kidnapper told him that he was going to be calling his phone, they put the phone on airplane mode. This guy who did the kidnapping was, in fact, so disordered in his thinking that he did try to call him twice. Mm -hmm. They missed those calls. The implication is that she could have been prevented from being raped again because the phone was easily trackable to mm -hmm. an area that was within was Lake Tahoe. Walking, of, walking distance of his parents' home. They had other evidence that uh, could have led them to believe, uh, could have led them to Mueller. They had, he, he had used Mueller, the, the assailant had used a track phone, which they were able to figure out was bought at like a Walmart. There was video of him getting the phone. They saw the video and said, ah, it could be the boyfriend. The case is an illustration uh, of confirmation bias. Um, this lead detective, Matt Mustard, um, there are some pretty unflattering police, I'm sorry, uh, articles that are written about him uh, before the one that I just read and subsequent in the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, and, and I want to take a step back for a minute. I don't like it when, pol when, when the Commonwealth, in our case, or the prosecution will call it, Monday morning quarterbacks, our clients, when they want to apply a standard ignoring context of the way people act. I am not a hypocrite. I am not, I'm a lot of things, but I'm not a hypocrite. I don't Monday morning quarterback police. I think anybody, any police detective initially, when Quinn came into his uh, in, in interview room, and told the story that he did. And if you, you you can watch the series and you can see what the the you know what the allegation is. It was it was outlandish. But on the other hand, you can't just narrow in and say, all right, I made my mind up. The guy's lying to me. If he says that the kidnapper is going to be calling the phone, leave the freaking phone on. How about the polygrapher? Oh yeah, they brought a polygrapher in and this is lie an detector. Yeah, lie detector. You are um, one of the investigative tools of the police, and I'm sure we've talked about this in a prior episode, is that they're allowed to lie to you. They're allowed to mislead you in an effort to get you to, um, to confess. Um, they can't beat you with a phone book. They can't, you know, uh, say that you're, uh, they can't appeal to like religion. There, there are a lot of things they can't do. What they can do is lie. They can say, 
Caroline Donato's in the next room and she just gave you up mm -hmm. and she's trying to uh, pin the whole thing on you, even though Caroline Donato hasn't said anything about me. Mm -hmm. And people have a hard time understanding that until they're they're in it. Um, in this case, they brought in this FBI. Until after they're in it. Yeah. In, in, in this case, they brought in an FBI polygrapher that night, the same day that he's being interrogated for After hours. he says he's been drugged and... yeah. Um, and they tell him and that he's he traumatized and he's been talking to police for hours and he has no lawyer and he, they put him in prison garb. And they tell him that he failed the test, even though it came out it, when they were threatening to sue. It was inconclusive. And, you know, the polygrapher is like leaning into him. I'm leaning away from the microphone, like really like kind of threatening, not th like menacingly. No, it was it was threatening positioning because the um, what's his name? Brian Quinn. 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 Um, is his, what's his first name? I think it's Matt. Matt Quinn. Uh, yeah, keep going. Okay. I'll figure it out. Quinn, the, the male, he's sitting in the corner. Uh, Aaron Quinn. Aaron Quinn. He's sitting in the corner. There's a table in front of him. And the only way out is to his right. The polygrapher gets right to his right. And he's a big guy. And he's telling him how he failed miserably. And then he leaves and you see Quinn just like putting himself in his hands, really confused. What people also don't know, aside from the police being able to lie to you, is that polygraphs are notoriously unreliable. They're not even admissible in a court of law because they're that unreliable. So an inconclusive result doesn't mean Quinn was lying either. An inconclusive result could have been he was tired. He was nervous. He'd he heard, been drugged with he NyQuil. He had been drugged with NyQuil. NyQuil. They literally, before you go into a private polygraph, you're told not to take any substances other than your normal routine prescription medication for that very reason. But again, it, and I want to temper our criticism. I mean, there's a lot of evidence here that this is a pretty what are like, we criticizing? bad police department i don't want this to be like a referendum on like monday morning quarterbacking because what you see in this in this uh mini series is that when aaron quinn walks into the police station there's a delay in reporting his his uh girlfriend missing he says it's because there was a camera placed and i assume the camera was still there that unless that there was a camera placed in the corner of his room and the kidnapper said if you call before a certain time i'm gonna kill her so he has to wait and then he doesn't get a call from the fifth kidnapper when he says that he's going to get a call. So he's like, you know, I, I got to make the call and he makes the call and he goes into the police, blah, blah, blah. But so you to me as an investigator, I've never been a cop. Yeah, you can have your suspicion, but you can't rule and you can't have tunnel vision from the outside of investigation. Can't jump to conclusions. And exactly. And that's that's what this boils down to is what they did. But, you know, there were um, they they didn't they didn't keep the phone on. They didn't investigate the, the person who uh, was on video buying the phone. And then they went a step further within days and trashed the victim Jeez. by <laughs> calling it a hoax um, because, you know, well, what other explanation was there? Right. And there was just so much evidence. The guy Mueller had um, done things like this previously. It's clear that he was, I've used the term disordered. He wanted to be caught. He right. wanted to be caught. Um, and he was like to, an intellectual who was disordered to the extent that afterwards, when they called it a hoax, he emailed again and said, it's not a hoax. It's me. Don't, don't destroy the reputation of these people. Right. You know, she was the victim what a complicated of individual. Oh, uh, he really complicated. But then to add insult to injury, the, the detective that same year was made law enforcement it, officer. Are you of talking about year. mustard? Yeah. But how about FBI agent? Uh, David Sesma, who had a relationship with Quinn's ex-girlfriend, who that whole kidnapping was for. Nobody knows why. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now, yeah, but now that they've opened up a can of worms, like the Chronicle's not letting this go, maybe out of the sense of maybe a little bit of guilt because they could have done more. I don't know. But um, there's an article January 31st, a couple days ago. I'm a puzzle maker. Trouble has long followed Vallejo detective in American Nightmare kidnapping case. The other thing that's powerful, and um, it, it, I've said this before, it helps us sometimes and sometimes it hurts us. This is all on video. Like this quote, I'm a puzzle maker. You see this detective um, basically interrogating Quinn from the time he walks in. 
And you see that he has made up his mind from the outset. And the one quote is horrible. I'm a, this is like 18 hours of questioning, Quinn. Oh, my God. Meanwhile, his, Quinn, poor Quinn, his girlfriend is Abducted. in South Lake Tahoe getting raped. And he's gone to the police. And this is what he's subjected to. And he's to. been traumatized and he's in fear and yeah. he's been drugged. I'm a pu- this is the detective to him. I'm a puzzle maker and I put a lot of puzzles together, Mustard tells Quinn during 18 hours of questioning. So now I get out my puzzle pieces and I start figuring out how do I make it so you look like a monster? Oh my <laughs> God. Before they found anything. It was so cringy. And he says, I didn't do Quinn says, I didn't do anything. And he's crying in the corner and he's like, Yeah, you did. Um and he became uh, officer of the year. This detective has been accused of uh, making racist comments to colleagues before. Um, he was accused of asking a uh, forensic uh, technician to kind of backfill evidence to make it look like to, to comport with his theory that it was a homicide. But the thing about Quinn coming in and making that out that or telling his story and his experience and the detective totally writing it off is confusing because within that same jurisdiction and within Mare Island, that's where there was all the peeping Toms. Like, Mm -hmm. wouldn't they have a record of that? Wouldn't that lend credibility? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think they got two and a half million for this. Um, And then whatever they got from Netflix, Netflix, I hope you paid them so much money dragging that police department well, through and, the mud. And uh, just to wrap this up, what resonated to me, I mean, it's it's emotional at the end. Um, you see their kids. That was so they, beautiful. They end up staying together. They have kids. They have daughters. Um, but we see this in our practice. All the time. We see. Well, not kidnapping like that. But. Myopia. We see to let, you know, to sometimes to this extent and we're dealing with a a defendant who's been accused and we have all this evidence to the contrary and nobody will pay attention to it. And what Pete's talking about is the prosecution or law enforcement. And law enforcement makes up their mind and decides to backfill. And there are, I have, I count them on my friends, detectives, with some of my very good friends and they're good detectives. And the best detectives have an open mind. Mm -hmm. They, my, my, my good friends and who are in integris, they wouldn't do what this guy did. Right. But there are detectives who do. And that's what's scary. And nobody knows it until they're in it. Um, so that's what resonated with me. Just watching and the fact that they have it all on video and you see it. I wish that some of ours were on video that we could have seen it. Mm-hmm. Pete texting me. What did you say? You're going to relate to some of this? Yeah. And I didn't know which part. There was there was three parts that I thought it could be. The first part was one of Quinn's lawyers and just she seemed like a badass lawyer. Yeah. And I was like, so did her partner. Yeah, yeah. They said, oh my god, he was wearing the windbreaker. Yeah. It's like you're gonna be on national television and you chose that. That's a Pete Kratz move. <laughs> I've known a windbreaker. Yeah, but you would wear like the cat socks and have your, your no, but what legs I found crossed about so that they would show. Was refreshing is when the guy came in and he said something like, What the F is this? Like yeah. it, he was very human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she was more like by the book. Yeah. Um but and then the other thing was Detective Mustard we have come across Detective Mustard in our own worlds. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I won't say more on that. Mm-hmm. And um, the third one was the detective that actually, I forget her name, but she actually unraveled the right. whole thing and she was so persistent and yeah. she was so excited and she was like, I and kept she, calling and I and kept calling. Made, and she made no apologies for no the No apologies and she, she felt like something wasn't right and she went with it. A lot of that goes to what we say before. We see something, it doesn't feel fair, we look into it, we mm-hmm. investigate it, and then we advocate against it. She did that. So mm-hmm. I was like, well, which part, Pete? You didn't answer me. I, the cop. The, the cop first cop. That we the, experienced the, you, together. Like from the outset, when you see like the way that he just wasn't going to be um, dissuaded from the fact, oh, the guy did it. Let's just wrap this mm-hmm. up. Let's find out how he did it. Um, we haven't come across our friend in a while. No. 
And on that note, anything else on this topic, Pete? No, I, I, I would highly recommend it. I thought it was really, really good. Don't don't zipper that <laughs> until we have the links oh, off. Right. He's got his uh, binder in front of him. All right, that's it for this Spiner's episode. Binder's really old too, by the way. It's really nice though. Thank you. Is that? It's yeah. not even really a binder. What is that? I don't know what you call this, but it has like all kinds of compartments in it. It's really nice. Did you get that as president of PAC? No, I think they gave it out. Well, I didn't get yeah, one. It was like swag, probably before you were a lawyer. That's it for this episode of Subject to Cross. Do you want to sign us out and do all the things? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, yes. Please feel free to email <laughs> us at subject to cross at com. Thank you. Bye bye. 